have a long and wonderful program tonight, an exceptional program, and people that you might not have met tonight if it wasn't for coming here. Part of this program is gonna be some video clips that Danny has organized. We have some speakers, and we also have a poet who's gonna read. What we'll do first is we'll see the video clips, which Danny will introduce, and then we can go into the full program, which is about the new book by Danny Schechter called Madiba from A to Z. And just to let you know that I go back with Danny a long time when he was with South Africa now, a real friend of Africa. Hey, welcome everybody. We're meeting at a, a time of a certain amount of sadness, the loss of Madiba, the long walk he wrote about and talked about, the turnout in South Africa to honor and respect him was really over overwhelming and overpowering for those of us who watched it with all of the contradictions of the many people who spoke in, on his behalf who did very little and gloried in their association with him even though they were part of governments or organizations that were less than supportive of the struggle. But having said that, there was a way in which he reached out and, and involved his, his enemies, his adversaries, as well as his many friends. And I think we saw that there. We'll talk more about that when we this round table gets off. But to set the scene and to uh, st start the program, I thought it might be interesting to relive some days uh, here in New York uh, in June of 1990, when uh, Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela came to New York as part of an effort by the ANC to thank Americans who had been supporting the struggle against apartheid. And I was very privileged uh, as, as a producer of the South African Now television series, and Willie Mazizi is in the house, one of our on-air uh, journalists, stand up, Willie, say hello. Uh, still a face of South Africa now, <laughs> in many ways. We had the opportunity, uh, the visit, but also to travel with Madiba on the plane across America, eight cities, historic visit uh, that galvanized people, packed stadiums, tremendous impact, as well as ex incited and excited uh, some of the enemies of the ANC in Miami who protested his visit and challenged his taking a friendship with Fidel Castro. This is something that he rejected totally when he was asked about that by various American media uh, personalities. So we had that opportunity. In the house with me, Kevin and Tommy, would you stand please? The um, entourage had sped off without us, but we were part of it and uh, we were ch challenged by it and changed by it as well. So this is from the movie, Madiba in America. I thought we'd run about 10 minutes of it just to remember uh, this moment of profound, uh, uh, profound exhilaration and triumph, uh, which no one expected, uh, certainly not the media here in New York. So here it is. It was just um, so unbelievable. Uh, I mean, you saw it happening, but it didn't seem to be true. You needed uh, someone next to you to pinch you, make you aware that you were not dreaming. And the greatest weapon Nelson carried with him, with him for us and was teaching the movement was that uh, we win the respect of the opponents. The medalists have won. Uh, that is the man. Mr. Nelson Mandela will be released at the Victor Verstaart prison on Sunday, the 11th of February at about 3 p.m. For so many years, he was only an image, a memory, and a reminder. His government wanted him forgotten. The world kept his name alive. Newspapers speculated on what he looked like, what he would be like. He really doesn't look at all uh, like the picture that we all imagine him to look like. And then on a Sunday afternoon in February, from a prison in an area of South Africa, better known for crushing grapes than men's spirits, he walked free. International media perched, and the motorcycles start moving. Nelson Mandela was home. And the crowd 
getting excited. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. I'm with you. I can only play some constructive role only if I work as a member of a team, as a member of the African National Congress. And what for you personally was the most vivid moment about returning? I mean, having your first meal at home, your first home-cooked meal, sleeping in your own bed for the first time in 28 years. The most pleasant memory when a man returns to his home after almost 28 years is when you close the bedroom door and to try and assure my wife that I'm back and that her problems will now be shared. After 10,038 days in prison on a life sentence for leading a resistance campaign of sabotage and after the African National Congress was banned and driven underground, he negotiated his release. It was said that a tip from a CIA agent led to his capture, but now millions of Americans demanded his freedom, watching in wonder. And I would watch television and say, he's gonna come, it's almost, and I'd go back. I threw both hands up. I went, oh my God, you know? And it was two white guys driving along to my left. And they blew their horns, and I looked over and, and became conscious and got my wheel again. And I sa they said, Lady, I think we need to be in your car. And I said, Nelson Mandela is free, he is out of prison. One of the few times uh, that I can remember, people who struggle for justice throughout the world had a common moment, a common thread, and a common victory. It was the ultimate kind of political statement, you know, that uh, he could go into prison, come out, and like, go like, uh, now where were we? South Africa greeted him first, welcoming him with an enthusiasm that even displays of police violence would not and could not contain. And then he announced that he would travel to thank the world's people for their support, that he would appeal to their governments to keep the pressure on, to keep their sanctions in place. Zambia was Mandela's first stop. His African National Congress comrades hadn't seen him since the 60s, the days of John F. Kennedy's presidency. He's here to meet the people of Sweden and to thank the people and the government of Sweden for his support. Well, this country in the summer of 11 days in June 1990, when an African political leader, a tribal chief by birth, a lawyer by profession, a revolutionary by necessity, visited the United States. It is not a travel log, but a film about how America responded and why. While we're recommitting ourselves to Nelson Mandela and the struggle in South Africa and all over the world, 
we have to recommit ourselves to the struggle here. May I have your attention, please? I'm sorry? How do you think Mr. Mandela's aircraft has left the Canadian airport seven minutes ago. <laughs> left the Canadian airport seven minutes ago. surprised at his height, uh, but uh, what, what amazed me constantly was his uh, humility. He's a, a very special human being. And this fellow here, oh, how are you? Sing, yeah. single oh, nice to I'm thrilled. This is the culmination of um, a lot of work in many years, but in many ways it's a staging ground for the uh, next uh, level of commitment. Yeah. Struggle for 76 years. Dick Gregory. Oh, yeah. 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 Here's a man come out of jail after 27 years with no money, no power, and has equal power with all world leaders. He has equal power with Queen Elizabeth, with Gorbachev, with Bush, because love supersedes all armies and all banks. And that's what he gives us. <laughs> it is an honor to be received with such a rousing welcome. The first stop, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, the largest black community in America. It's like an explosion, you know, people came from out of everywhere out of the projects, out of the houses, out of the homes, off the factories, from everywhere they came because they knew they wanted to see Mr. Mandela, they wanted to be a part of history, they wanted to touch, they wanted to feel, they wanted to just hear from Mr. Mandela. The police tried to keep the kids out, but there were too many kids for the police to even to contain. I think it was almost a thousand kids when they hit the fence. Say what? Say what? Say what? Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Bush, 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 Bush. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Educated man from the motherland. You see, they call me a star, but that's not what I am. I'm a jungle brother, a true blue brother, and I've been to many places you'll never discover. To enjoy the support of the youth, the future leaders of this country and the world, cuts down my age almost by 25 years. I want to see Mr. Um, Nelson Mandela too because he, I ne I've never met um, anybody famous face to face before that has like, um, well, My name is Wendy and the place to be and I Got a message I would like to speak. So open your ears and just listen to me. I said to open your ears and just listen to me. Nelson Mandela. In South Africa, when we see you, we see the young lions in the struggles of the South African people. And when we see you, we usually greet you by saying, Amanda! Amanda! I really never understood how people get misty-eyed over the flag and apple pie, but I felt that way with Nelson Mandela in New York. And I think that was the feeling that black Americans have had, perhaps for the first time in American history. Well, it's a nice feeling for people to talk of you in terms of being a hero, of being one who has sacrificed. But as I say, this is not really directed at me. Uh, I am used as a peg on which to hang 
all the adulation uh, of the African National Congress. That paper was interesting. It was explaining to Nelson and Winnie Mandela what a tick tape parade was. Because they, they didn't know what it was. They just knew that it was supposed to be something good. And so we described how we had to import the ticker tape because they have electronic uh, transmissions and whatnot now. And so you don't have the ticker tape. So we, we got it from Connecticut and someplace else, as I recall. It was supremely ironic that Nelson Mandela would uh, go past the buildings that support apartheid economically on Wall Street and Broadway. I'm just hoping a little bit of the feeling um, of joy that is here in New York and, and warmth that has been shown to the Mandelas and, and seems to be sort of spreading. It's, it's, it's infectious. People are um, reacting to one another uh, with warmth and friendliness. I mean, people actually greet you on the streets of New York. Good morning. Hi, how are you? And when I stress that he brings us all together, here's a guy standing behind me on my back and I don't even know him. You have people from all generations coming out. You had people from all nationalities coming out, people from all over lands. And it was, it was a one time that a West Indian wasn't going to look at a Haitian and say, you're not my brother. Or a black wasn't going to look at a white and say, you're not my brother. Because they understood, man, it's all about him and it's all about the cause right now. And it damn sure ain't all about these differences. I can't imagine, you know, like being in prison one year, OK, two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, your kids are growing up. Who knows what they're telling you? 25 years, 27 years. I mean, it's something that is it's just the, the feat of human endurance and to come out with his fist raised and to have his will intact affirms a very powerful thing of what humans can really be. Mr. Mandela is a George Washington, a Bolivar, a King, a Herzl. He is like a modern day Moses leading the people of South Africa from enslavement at the hands of the Pharaohs. The wonderful citizens of New York have demonstrated that we, the oppressed people of South Africa and the ANC, are admired and respected. Nelson Mandela's mission is simple, and at the same time, an immense challenge. In less than two weeks, he must visit eight cities, mobilize his supporters, win over his critics, reassure public opinion, convince the government to keep sanctions in place, and raise millions to meet the ANC's desperate needs. He is 71 years old. I couldn't imagine that uh, I could attract uh, such support. And as I say, it is something, you know, which uh, hit me full flush uh, in the face. We are a people who affirm and will work for a world where all children in South Africa, in Southern Africa, in the whole earth will be able to sleep safe in their mother's arms. We are a people called to remember those who are oppressed and broken and battered and jailed and murdered in the name of apartheid. And to a new South Africa and a new world, non-racial, democratic and free.
as dramatically as the Red Sea opened, as dramatic as the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, the walls of Berlin came tumbling down, let the walls of apartheid come tumbling down. cultural capital of black America. Watch me flip and rip on the freedom tip. Open your mind, see the point of the ice pick. I stand tall while my brothers still choose to crawl. Black power, it's in effect, y'all. But you don't understand, you're still a slave to the man. Prepare for revolution. Some suckers say we're free, I gotta disagree. Half my posse's in the penitentiary. So I'ma drop and kick the science with defiance. Because I have no alliance with suckers who choose not to act like when they are black. Get out my face with that, you better ease back. Cause Mandela did 27 hard ones. Not in a window room, but in a barred one. To silence the ice, they'll probably put a bullet than me, but I'm prepared to die and Mandela's free. My brother, I've spent 19 years in prison in the United States for my political beliefs. And you, sir, you were the symbol that helped sustain me and other African-American political prisoners. brother we love you and we will not give up the fight 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 we know that garvey spoke here we know that carlos cook spoke here and malcolm x and we want to have nelson Mandela speak here in this community because he was the you know like the cutting edge of this long history now the political forces had another idea they wanted harlem to be this another festive occasion so it was an intense struggle for that I grew up in the 1960s and I saw the fruits of the civil rights struggle live. Grew up with pride about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and I think that the young brothers and sisters today don't have that pride. What a beautiful love story those two have. You know, it's inspiring, it's inspirational. She needs no introduction. Will you please acknowledge Sister Winnie Mandel. Thank you. I was told to introduce myself, but I'm sure most of you know that I am Betty Shabazz or Mrs. Malcolm X. I just want you to just stand there and cry. All of the burdens that not only have been on my back, but, but people who would like to be free. I identify so directly with her. I identify so directly with the ideals Malcolm X stood for. And uh, in her, I just saw a reincarnation of Malcolm X himself. White, black, brown, red, yellow. But ladies and gentlemen, what color you are. It was like a lightning striking. These two big forces uh, hugging each other. It looked like it was freedom uh, coming through. You could really see it turning a corner and coming right at you. We had it, uh, almost about 200,000 uh, people out there in the street. It was awfully good. I mean, I, I just uh, cannot even think of another way of putting it. Is there a South African word? I greet you all, comrades, here in Soweto of America. You went to Harlem yesterday. You see the evidence of our own separateness, don't you? Yes, that is correct. And we, you also see countless people, many of them white, many of them sincere, who can't wait to get their picture taken with you and your husband. Do you wonder about our hypocrisy here? What Harlem did to me yesterday was that complete identity with the peoples of this country. Uh, throughout the years, we have learned to understand and appreciate the fact that um, racialism is an international cancer. To be sure, but we should... The pains of the black Americans here. Yeah. 
the World Trade Center in the Financial District. Here, Mandela presents the ANC's economic program to hundreds of business leaders. How heavy are they still playing? Are they trying to backpedal that, nationalizing uh, industries once in post-apartheid? He's talking about financial institutions, he's talking about mining. That's what's in the Freedom Charter. Yeah. A form of economy will be decided solely by our determination to make the economy perform fully from the point of view of ensuring full employment, maximum productivity, and the development of a social consciousness. Any formula, any option which will enable us to do this, we will adopt. I think he won a lot of friends and a lot of supporters. Uh, the reassurance he gave to people that uh, he really plans to have a mixed economy, that there will be a role for U.S. investors and other investors in a post-apartheid South Africa, and the point he got across was, look, if you want to come and be part of the future, then you've got to help bring that about. Today that we got the call that uh, said that uh, the Yankee Stadium had to be canceled. I felt that if we could not fill the stadium, we fit the well, that morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we finally got home. I sat alongside of the bed. I just started thinking about what the man said about, you know, not being able to fill that stadium. And I just got this chill, and I just started trembling. And I trembled with anger. And the tremble said, if it kills us, if it kills me, we're going to fill Yankee Stadium. Somewhere, Somewhere there's a child of crying, crying for freedom, crying for freedom in oh, South Africa. Somewhere, 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 somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere child of crying, crying somewhere. somewhere. ever been a voice that has more clearly caught the imagination and the spirit and fired the hope of freedom than the voice of the Deputy President of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. The principle of one person, one vote on a common and non-racial voters' role is therefore our central strategic objective. Throughout our lifetime, we have fought against white domination 
and have fought against black domination. We intend to remain true to this principle to the end of our days. So that was what it was like. Uh, Mandela in America. Uh, of course, uh, this should have been played by the television stations here in New York to mark those days, but it wasn't. But I am so grateful for Lisa, Global Information Network, for organizing uh, this Africa Roundtable. We're going to hear from a number of, of different people here about Madiba and about the politics and the future of South Africa. And there's going to be a chance for people to have a say. We have an African poet with us who's going to share some of his work and, and hopefully have a, some great food and a chance to get to know each other a little better. So that's the idea of this. I've been spending on, uh, two, on, on Monday the 5th of, uh, the second rather, of, of December, we had a book party launching my book and you know wasn't sure that we'd be able to get any attention for Madiba for the issue on the fifth three days later uh, he, he died and uh, as you've seen there's been there was a lot of coverage but I, I don't think the character of the coverage really does justice to what he stood for what the values of the struggle were what the issues in South Africa are you know, the, the antics of a so-called interpreter or President Obama taking a picture of himself or people booing the president, uh, you know, seemed to dominate the news coverage and not the history, uh, the meaning of the long walk to freedom, which is Nelson Mandela's contribution. Uh, the movie Mandela Long Walk to Freedom opens nationwide on Christmas Day. It's playing here in New York. And uh, as part of that movie, I was brought down to South Africa to document the making and the meaning of it uh, by the producers. Uh, it's the first South African film, uh, the most you know, costly South African film that there's been, and it was shot for 80 days in South Africa. Uh, and I was privileged to be invited to document it and was, in the, was in the, uh, on the set, and I was also very conscious of the setting because many of the issues uh, that, that were fought for are still unresolved. Uh, you know, just two uh, quick examples. Uh, we were shooting, they had recreated Soweto, 1950s, uh, on the back lot of the Cape Town Film Studio. And they had built uh, these houses, and one of them was uh, Madiba's house. And there were something like several thousand extras, people from nearby townships, Langa and others, who came uh, to watch the filming or to participate in the filming. And in some ways, the movie was probably the most effective employment project uh, that the ANC, <laughs> more effective than a lot of the government projects. Uh, people came out and, but after uh, the scenes were shot, a delegation of people from a nearby shantytown township came to the producers and said, you know, they wanted to see if they could buy the houses. And, you know, the thing was, the houses were made out of plastic. They weren't real houses. They were t movie houses, okay? And it was a poignant reminder that poverty is still very pervasive and the issues that so many people sacrificed for uh, have, have not been really resolved in many ways. So that was one thing. The other thing that was very interesting is they rebuilt Robben Island Prison on the back lot of the film studio because since because the years that he was there that's been painted since then it's now a tourist attraction they really couldn't shoot in it uh, they shot exteriors but they to shoot the scenes in the prison they rebuilt the prison exactly to scale using photographs so that when some of the former prisoners came 
uh, to the set, uh, they felt they were right at home because they they uh, recognized, you know, the prison, you know, the, the experience. It brought back the experience of the prison. In another instance, the movie recreated the Sharpeville massacre, uh, and and. Uh, what was amazing about it is because we've all seen sort of this footage of people being shot down, but they actually recreated the police station where the police were. And uh, you saw the police interacting with each other and coming out and firing on the people. And I, I went there with an old friend of mine, great uh, South African photographer, Peter Magubani. And Magubani had come to, to the Sharpville that day and he you know, as, as is the story of many photographers, he got there a few minutes too late and missed the money shot, missed the, uh, the you know, the, 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 the moment because, uh, it, you know, it was chaos and all the rest of it. But anyway, he came with me and we sat in the police station. Here were all these men wearing the police uniforms of the day, speaking in Afrikaans. Uh, and he began having serious flashbacks uh, of this period. I thought he would be able to kind of give me an interview afterwards as somebody who had been there. He couldn't talk. He was speechless. And it had such an emotional impact on him as it, as it did for me, having grown up looking at the photographs of apartheid South Africa, the Rivonia trial, and now suddenly I was in it. I was actually in the courthouse. I was actually uh, standing there with the people who looked very much like the crowds of the day, carrying the signs of the day. So it was, it was a lot of effort was made to uh, make it authentic and to try to uh, capture the, the flavor and the, and the fever of, of this particular time in history. And it was extremely powerful. They built the, uh, the courthouse with, uh, with a downstairs, so they had a, a, a staircase that went up into the prison. And they captured the meetings between the lawyers and Mandela. Uh, you know, this was a, an incredible moment because he had written this speech, I am prepared to die. And his lawyer said, no, please, don't say that. Are you crazy? You're giving it to them on a platter. They, you know, they would ha be happy with that. You've got to, and he said, no, no, this is my speech. I'm giving, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for us. A and the George Bezos, his attorney, uh, went to him and said, no, Madiba, you've got to, we have to change this. He says, I'm not changing anything. He says, no, no, no. Can we just add three words to, to, to your speech? And the three words were, if needs be. In other words, I am prepared to die. But if needs, if needs be, I am prepared to die. So in other words, he's giving an out. He's saying, I don't want to die, uh, but I will. Uh, and, I, and I'm willing to, and all the other men were willing to as well. Because in the whole, this whole scene of, of, of the trial, they were told every day they were going to be killed. Uh, they were living with this very presence of death. And this is captured in, in the film, and Idris Elba does a tremendous recreation of, of uh, Mandela, interpretation, let's put it, uh, of Mandela's speech uh, that day in prison. So it's worth seeing. Those of you who know South Africa well, will be disappointed because of the things that are left out, as is often the case in a movie. You know, tele characters are telescoped and chronologies are some, you know, summarized and, uh, you know, it's the dramatic arc that they go for, not necessarily, it's not a PhD thesis. I know there are some professors in the room who would probably be disappointed by the lack of footnotes, you know, but nevertheless, uh, no, I'm kidding, uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, nevertheless, this was a um, a work of art to try to capture this. And what was significant was that the the producer of the movie, Anand Singh, had been working for 16 years to make this movie. And every time he sort of had it together, it fell apart. He had these stars committed, and they took other roles. And the director, he had to do this. Morgan Freeman was doing something else. This the, the Denzel couldn't make the dates. What, whatever it was. It just kept, you know, it was a Hollywood horror story. And they went through 50 versions of the script. So, you know, the process of this took 16 years. So this was his life, in a sense, to try to bring this story 
The Long Walk to Freedom to a world audience. This was his passion to do. And even then, he felt like every time there was a cut, something had to be cut out, he took it personally. You know, it was like slicing a part of himself off because, you know, it was an important scene or it was an important moment or what have you. And so he approached me about writing a, a, a book about uh, Madiba that reflected some of the, the ex feelings and experiences of the people who knew him best. And because I had produced the South African Now program, I had interviewed some of these people before. I knew them or they knew of me. And they, over 150 people agreed to be interviewed, which was you know, a great honor for me to be able to sit down with them. And I, I try to have conversations with them, not an interview. I wasn't looking for facts. I was looking for feelings and uh, experiences, basically. And, and I also, you know, the clerk agreed, okay, to, to speak to me, which was a, a shock, although I was a little manipulative there. And when we made the request, they said, no, Nelson Mandela really wants you to sit down and do this interview with this guy, you know. So <laughs> he agreed to do it. But, you know, Bishop Tutu and, uh, you know, Ahmed Kathrada, the people who were in prison with him, uh, agreed to talk to me. And then I faced the challenge of how to present this. He's written his own autobiography, 800 some pages. There's a biography of him, 600 and some pages. Uh, that's been done. There are a number of other biographies and interpretations of interpretations. So there's a big kind of Mandela literature. And here I had this material, and what I was going for was, what don't I know? What don't we know about what happened in this particular moment? Or, or what, uh, what are some of the contradictions here? What are some of the, the texture of this event that, that's different, you know? And I decided on this format of an A to Z. Uh, thematic, looking at him thematically, because everybody has one image of him, the kindly grandfather, the, the uh, you know, inspiring leader, the person who promoted peace and reconciliation, you know, whatever the buzz word is. And even there, uh, that didn't do justice to his many sides. And so I settled on this idea of an A to Z, uh, of, you know, A is athlete, uh, which is his, devotion to boxing, which, you know, I took as sort of some kind of recreational conceit, but actually the fact that he was a boxer, he developed the, the, the discipline and the diets and, and whatnot that, that boxers have in training. He took that very seriously, drove, as I later learned, a lot of his comrades crazy because he pushed them for physical exercise. He ran around the cell when they were in a collective cell together, literally, for an hour, okay? He had a, 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 a you know, the night of his release when he gets out of jail and everybody's exhausted. It was, I have a whole chapter on just what that day was like, what was really going on behind the scenes. It's fascinating. And, you know, at, at four in the morning, he calls a uh, Trevor Manuel, who later became the finance minister of South Africa, uh, on his phone at home, wakes him up and says, Trevor, do you have my weights? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I mean, this is a person who had a tremendous discipline and a, a, a tremendous sense of himself, but he was a lawyer, he was a lover, he was a, a comrade, he was a, uh, you know, a person who negotiated with his enemies, a person who was a diplomat as well. And, and in, a way, in, in a way, he was a performer. And the role that he performed most successfully was the role of Nelson Mandela. He created, in a sense, this larger than life persona. He had been in prison. He played Creon in, uh, in, in Sophocles' Antigone. He played Abraham Lincoln, I guess because he was a tall guy, in another play. But he had a sense of performance and a sense of himself and his stature. And I think that that is what allowed him to keep his cool when other people lost their cool, when other people got overly emotional or in a counterproductive way. And so this is the kind of Madiba that I tried to dissect in this book in, in 26 letters from A to Z and also included in it a, a uh, little kind of uh, 
note to the young, young people in South Africa, all of whom I talked with all, all along, who are called not students but learners. That's their, their, their designation. And you know, many of them, when you ask them, what, what, why, are you, why are you loving Madiba this way? What did he do? And they, they'd say, oh, you know, he's, they treat him like a superhero. You know, through the image of television, he saved us. He sacrificed for us. He did this and he did that. They really didn't have a sense of a movement that he was part of a struggle, not just uh, a lone actor. You know, not just you know. And the media then responded by treating him like Madonna, and giving him the full celebrity treatment with which he was very uncomfortable most of the time. He was also could be very vain. He, he you know. He didn't mind the attention sometimes, but I, I, my sense was, and I made six documentaries with him, which you know gave me some exposure uh, to, to being with him and watching him, and the way he worked crowds, the way he dealt with politicians, the way he handled conflicts. That he was, you know, he was very conscious of the role. The people expected him to play a certain role, and he played that role, and he played it, I would think, very well given the, the response to him and the love that people showed for him. So having said all that, we have some copies of the book here. Seven Stories Press uh, put this book out. My editor, Dan Simon, uh, his uncle, I met before I met Dan, I met Dan when he was a young kid, but his uncle, Barney Simon, was the person who was one of the creators of the market theater uh, in South Africa, which was the kind of mecca of, of uh, theater, you know, struggle theater and, and, and culture. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he was delighted to, to, to put out the book and we're trying to get it out. We don't have a big marketing budget, promotional budget, et cetera, but we have gotten a lot of interest from many online sources and many writers. And I'm hoping that we can get more attention for it because I think it's an antidote to the, you know, Mandela as superhero uh, myth, which I think really needs to be challenged. He challenged it a lot, but when he did challenge it, uh, people didn't want to hear it in some cases. They didn't want to hear him be self-deprecating. You know, they felt that was just insincere, but, but it really wasn't, I, I don't think. So there's a lot more to talk about the politics. It deals with the economic negotiations that people don't know about that took place in South Africa that brought in kind of neoliberalism and, and the compromises and concessions that were made that you know South Africa is still dealing with to this day. So there's a lot of politics in it as well as a personal account. But I'll be happy to sign books for anybody uh, who wants one and also hope that I can make you a kind of a uh, a, 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 um, a missionary for the book and bring it, because we want to get it into schools, we want to get it into libraries, we want to get people to learn about this man through his extraordinary life and, and the many dimensions that he brought to his work and all that. And we're very delighted that we have with us uh, here somebody who actually was with Nelson Mandela in the Youth League of the ANC in 19, what, 49, what was the year? Uh, and I hope I remember that uh, Dr. Jordan uh, is gonna be uh, talking as well. He was, he, he's lived this whole story himself and he's written the book and in the book, there's a wonderful letter from the Bantu education authorities. These are the people who handled black education. They called Bantu education. And it's a letter to him basically throwing him out of the school system, saying he is unfit to be part of this system. So anyone who is unfit to be part of Bantu education is welcome here, for sure. <laughs> okay, so let's give him a hand. Also with, with us, uh, Herb Boyd. Herb is a writer with the Amsterdam News, has been really a, a, a advocate and a knowledgeable historian. He's written about Malcolm X, he's written about uh, uh, Madiba, he knows all of this deeply and he's tried in a, in a beautiful way to bring this story to the black community in America and, and I think he's been very successful. Uh, Ron Nixon is here. Uh, Ron works with the New York Times, that's why he has a nice suit. Uh, but he, but he uh, has written a really fascinating 
expose book about the role of black Americans who worked for the, and you know, kind of for the apartheid system. And you'll be surprised to find out who some of them were. And he was, I think, very uh, fearless in, in presenting this information. So he'll be here as well. And other, and I'm sure there are other people in the room with a lot to say and experiences. Who am I missing, Lisa? Our poet. Would you stand, please, sir? And say hello. Do you want to hold off and then we'll give you the proper introduction, you know, that you really deserve as a, as a man of Zimbabwe in the house, okay? So with that all said, uh, I want to thank you for, again for coming and, and we're going to show a little bit more of the film, hopefully if there's time, but I thought we'd go to some of the other speakers and give everybody a chance to have their say. I call on the Honorable Herb Boyd. Uh, say a few words, uh, and then let's move this program along. Thank you very much. Let me say, first of all, um, Danny, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I mean, looking at that film, it brought back so many memories, and to see um, Jim Bell, to see uh, G2, to see Dr. Betty Shabazz, to, and in the background for a moment, Bill Lynch, some of all of the stalwarts in this struggle, and of course to be right there with Alone Bay and Aruba on 125th Street. I mean, it's just, it just, it really racks me up with memories of, of that moment. And I mean, that film should be connected right to a long walk to freedom as far as I'm concerned. It, got, it provides a kind of contexture and, and brings the, the whole experience of the USA, USA together. The United States of America and the Union of South Africa. And of course, that connection is an old one going on. I mean, with ANC, for example, with the NAACP, there's a connection. And when Madiba spoke in Harlem, he provided, he brought those two worlds together in, in a very, very meaningful way. My own experience, and Danny and I go all the way back to uh, 1800, I mean, into. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to the uh, late 60s in terms of uh, dealing with the African continent. Um, I first encountered uh, some of his writings, you know, through my association with attorney Robert Van Lierop and in the whole making of a Lucha Continua and a Povo Organizado, which is these liberation films, you know, of Mozambique. And, and one of the things that, in 1994, I had the opportunity to go to South Africa and cover the elections there. And I mean, that week there, to see the, the opportunity that these, the black Africans had never had. This is the first multi-racial election in that whole history. And, I have been studying African history and teaching African history for nearly 50 years now. And, and all of those things comes flooding back on you to see those long lines across the countryside. I interviewed a couple of uh, senior citizens there. One woman, she was 85 years old. And it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. She'd already been there about five hours. And she would be there another eight hours just to get even close to voting. And I, and I asked her, you know, I said, what does it take? It's, the weather was very chilly. This is in April. And she said that I've waited my whole life for this. I can wait a little bit longer. It's no big deal for her. And such was the spirit of many of those people who, who came from miles away and to watch those lines snaking across the countryside. You know, I was in Cape Town, so I had an opportunity to go outside into some of the so-called 
uh, Bantu stands, which of course were fast coming to, to elimination, and, and to see exactly the conditions of the people, although I had done it several times before. Uh, one time in which I was taking pictures in Soweto and had one of the uh, police approach me and took my camera from me, pulled all the film out, and smashed it under his foot. Uh, because there was this small image of a fading Nelson Mandela on a crumbling wall that I wanted to capture. And of course, at that time, <laughs> this is 1986, which his image was absolutely forbidden. You know, I didn't see it anywhere. And anyone caught with any of those magazines or newspapers, and of course, my thing was to go straight away to the Sowetan and to hang out with the uh, newspaper, the journalists, the publishers there, because that was my introduction to move around. Uh, at the same time, you know, it was all kind of, the, the whole divestment movement was in full flight. And then later on, to go to Siskai and the Transkai, to go to King Williamstown, where Steve Biko is buried. So all of these things, you know, is a part of this here context in which Danny has been involved in for many years. It was a pleasure, t again, Danny, to c my students are still kind of uh, trembling at, in revelation about all of your experiences there and, and how you brought it home to them. And these are young people who are hearing it for the first time. I mean, they're in their, you know, in their 20s and everything, so South Africa and Mel Nelson Mandela, all those things are absolutely alien to them, but you brought it home to them. <laughs> very interested and, and very alert and, and, and uh, you know it showed you that if somehow we can connect with with the young younger audiences and people, they'll be they'll be very receptive to wanting to learn more about uh, this era and we have a duty in a way to do that. That's what her was doing. Well, we'll be together. I'm going to get out of the way here because you've got a number of speakers. Um, uh, we'll be together tomorrow at the UN. There's a tribute to Nelson Mandela tomorrow at the UN, and uh, a number of, I know David Dinkins, is, uh, he, he's promises to be there, Danny Glover. I'm not sure if Harry is going to make it, Harry Belafonte is going to make it or not, but he's am among those who have been invited. So it's an opportunity again for us to celebrate this magnificent life of, um, and he said that coming out of the, the three prisons, the, from, from Robin Islands to Poolsmore to Victor Verster, and he said one of the things that the prison did for him is that he matured. And it's hard to you know, think about, he wasn't mature before, he certainly was but a certain kind of political maturation that he was talking about in terms of patience and the kind of truth and reconciliation stuff that would be part and parcel of his later days, particularly in a, a one-term president in Africa, you know, that can be emulated, I think, far and wide. But Madiba was, and I look forward, Danny, to reading the book, uh, getting my autograph copy, my review copy, I mean, getting, uh, getting my, <laughs> <laughs> I promise to do that, but and to say it in final and in preparation for the for the poet there, um, William Ernest Henley, he wrote a poem called Invictus, and Nelson said that was his his favorite poem. So it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scrolls. He was, he was the captain of his fate, the master of his soul. Thank you very much. Dr. Jordan uh, came down uh, quite a ways. Uh, to, to join us here and manage to survive a New York taxi ride. Uh, and we welcome you. As a South African, I would very much like to thank everybody for being here to show respect.
for our departed uh, great leader, Nelson Mandela. And uh, number one, he easily was the greatest man that has ever lived in the tide of times. I met him for the first time at home. We come from the same region, but I had him speak when I was a freshman at the University of Fort Hare in 1949. There aren't very many of you here who were around in 1949. He inspired us to talk uh, in, to, he inspired us to join the revolution and he made us recite this poem and which I've never forgotten which I even taught when I was teaching at SUNY Albany uh, by none other than that great African-American freedom stalwart of all times, Frederick Douglass. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who favor freedom and their deprecate agitation are men, women who want crops without plowing the land. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. He was uh, driving us uh, into war. Uh, now, he said one of the things uh, that show what kind of man uh, this man was, he said, among other things, <coughs> uh, when before he was sentenced to life imprisonment, <coughs> he said, and uh, the author here mentions it in a book. Excuse me. I have fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to see realized. But, addressing the charge, my Lord, it is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. That's how great Mandela was. Now, in his book, page 71, Danny mentions that he comes from a tradition of Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu, the philosophy of Ubuntu uh, in Southern Africa, South Africa in particular, those who won't know what it means, Ubuntu can be defined as humaneness, a pervasive spirit of caring, community, harmony and hospitality, respect and responsiveness that individuals and groups display for one another. Ubuntu is the foundation for the basic values that manifest themselves in the way African people think and behave towards each other and everyone else they encounter. One of the most important attributes of Ubuntu is the high degree of harmony and continuity throughout the system. Ubuntu is predicated on human in interdependence. The driving room norms are reciprocity, suppression of self-interest, and virtues of symbiosis. The preeminence of collective can be observed more closely in the extended family as an organized unit. Here the emphasis is 
the unity of the whole rather than the sensitiveness of an individual. Now, this is what Mandela stood for. This is what Mandela taught. And uh, really, uh, we've missed a man, a man and a half. And uh, as the poet said, uh, some men are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them. Fortunately, both of these three axioms apply to Mandela. He was born great as a prince of the Abatembu nation. <coughs> he had all the praises thrust upon him, the United Nations, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, and everybody knows Mandela. And fortunately, with Mandela, he never wanted to be remunerated for that. Very few have lived for so long. He died at 45, have done so much for so many without counting on remuneration. He spent <coughs> 27 of his prime years lingering in the jails of South Africa for his defense of freedom. And boy, those jails of South Africa are terrible, I tell you. I've been in them, not once, not twice, many times. They are real torturing. And here he comes out and preaching, not only to South Africa, reconciliation. He preached the world, the world over. He believed that there is only one race on earth, the human race. And everybody belongs to this human race, irrespective of color, creed, or anything. And I still would like to see or hear of a leader who, after being oppressed as he was, is going to come out preaching like that. And as I say, uh, his life, as the poet says, was gentle. And the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say, this was a man. Once again, I'm glad to be here. And I'm glad you have come here uh, to at least celebrate, not mourn, to celebrate the life of one of the greatest ever, one of the greatest men who ever lived, my countryman and leader, Nelson Mandela. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. He is uh, an uncle to a friend of ours and uh, told me that as a baby he used to hold him uh, on high, so that's a nice image to have. Uh, Ron Nixon uh, is a journalist, but he's also somebody who's been a close observer of politics and, and uh, a close observer of politics in the African-American community and has written about this, and I wonder if you could share yes. your, your findings. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, actually. I'm sorry. Um, I, I want to uh, thank Lisa for uh, inviting me here, and, and um, also want to take an opportunity to to mention that uh, I have ties to two of the speakers. They they just don't know that I have ties to them. Dr. Jordan, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, don't know you, but really glad to meet you. Herb Boyd probably doesn't remember, but I called him um, like. 30 years ago, I guess, when uh, for career advice when I was working at a small black newspaper in South Carolina. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I read his book and just took a chance and just called. And he answered and didn't hang up and actually uh, gave me some pretty good advice. So, pleasure to meet you in person, sir. Thank you. 
And uh, Danny as well. I mean, I've known Danny through a number of different ways. Um, I think the last time I saw him was in South Africa, actually, at a, at a barbecue or a braai, as they call it there. Um, but in the 90s, when he was doing a show called Rights and Wrongs that was uh, hosted by like, Charlene Hunter Gall, I, I did a story for The Nation magazine. Yes, I wrote for The Nation magazine. Uh, <laughs> that uh, about uh, Nigeria lobbying to keep sanctions from being imposed uh, on them using some of the same things that I talk, uh, talk about in the book that I'll mention in a minute. But he um, hired me to do some, some minor work on the, on the show and, and gathering some documents and stuff. And so I appreciate it. You know, you helped me out there and got me a burger or two. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, I was invited to talk about a, a book, an, an e-book that I wrote called Operation Blackwash. Um, Apartheid South Africa's 46-year propaganda war on black America. And the book is about black Americans who lobbied for the South African government. And yes, I said for the South African government, because when I say you know, that people go for, really, for? Yes, so, um, I'm sorry? I said I believe that. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so this, the, the um, what I find um, you know, interesting in looking at all the coverage that you've seen with the, the death, death of Nelson Mandela is this sort of outpouring of universal sympathy and love. Uh, but if you go back and look at the both television, uh, newspapers, magazines uh, during the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, it tells a very different picture. Uh, about what uh, was thought of, of Nelson Mandela and the apartheid struggle uh, itself. And I was asked to, um, to b contribute an idea for a publishing startup in South, South Africa um, that I eventually wrote this ebook for. And the idea was to show the links that the South African government went through to maintain its system of segregation. It not only is something that goes back to the, 80, the 90s, early 90s, the 80s, and the 70s, but in fact goes back to the 40s. And it starts with a gentleman named Max Jurgen. Uh, Max Jurgen, um, for the historians, was a co-founder of an organization called the Council on African Affairs that he co-founded with Paul Robeson. Other people involved in that were <coughs> W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Methune, um, Ralph Bunch. And uh, the CAA was based in Harlem. They actually held a huge rally in the 40s to raise money for uh, a famine that happened in South Africa. And they raised, I believe, like $17,000, which is for people who are really good at math, you can figure out what that is in today's dollars. Um, but in 48 or so, right before the National Party took over in South Africa and, and established apartheid as official policy, the policy has existed, but the National Party established an official policy. Jurgen and um, Paul Robeson had a falling out uh, from some financial irregularities and some other things. Jurgen, by the way, had lived in South Africa working for the YMCA for 14 years. Lived in the Eastern Cape, <coughs> um, taught some classes at Fort Hare and uh, was an influence on uh, Thabo Mbeki, the second president of South Africa, a uh, black president of South Africa. Uh, father was influenced by, by Jurgen, as were a number of other people who had met him, including Nelson Mandela, had met him uh, uh, then and also later on. But um, so Jurgen has this falling out with Paul Robeson. He immediately, um, overnight, turns from being someone who's against colonization <clears throat> to being an, a, an apologist for not only South Africa, but Rhodesia and a number of, of other uh, places uh, there. And, um, and becomes this, this, this rabid anti-communist, makes several trips to South Africa on behalf of the government. 
to talk about the, 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 the wonderful things that apartheid brings to um, black people there. Uh, and the New York Times, among other organizations at the time, covered this because this was big news. The New York Times also covered the split between Robeson and, and Max Jurgen because uh, that was also big news. This was the first uh, anti-apartheid group to be formed in the U.S. To, to, to try and bring attention to what was happening there. So this was something that, that I didn't, I didn't think a lot of people actually knew about. Now, I, I myself did not know about this until I actually started, started looking into it. And so um, Jurgen, one, one of the interesting things about Jurgen is that he goes on one of these trips in 1957, I believe in the book, and he's going to do a speech about you know, how the sep policy of separate development is both good for blacks and whites. But he almost causes his minor stir there because he is bringing his wife, who's white. <clears throat> and if you're going to speak on behalf of the apartheid government, you can't bring your white wife to talk about the great things about apartheid, right? Because where is she going to stay? So the U.S. government arranged for her to go spend some time in Uganda, or what, what is now Uganda, vacationing while he talks about um, the wonderful things uh, that apartheid brings to, to blacks and, and whites. Um, moving further into the, the 70s, uh, but there is uh, a gentleman that a lot of you probably know his name, uh, Andrew Hatcher. He was the uh, deputy press secretary for Kennedy, but he also became a lobbyist for the South African government after the killing of the children in Soweto in uh, 76. He was hired as a lobbyist to present a black face uh, to not only uh, keep sanctions from being imposed against South Africa, but to also recognize the, the independent homelands that the South African government had pushed uh, blacks there into. Uh, and Jurgen's moment, uh, I guess, is he's up in Harlem. Uh, Jurgen, I mean not Jurgen, but uh, Hatcher. Hatcher, by the way, is a co-founder of Boys and Girls Club. Um, I mean 100 black men, I'm sorry. 100 black men, he's a, he's a co-founder of that. He's up in Harlem and he's at this event um, with a South African uh, official who they are trying to convince people that, well, apartheid is it's bad, but sanctions are worse because you would basically hurt black people if you impose sanctions against. He has this moment where he's debating George Hauser on NBC and, and Hauser, you know, who was with a committee on, on Africa, uh, who um, is just astonished. He is, he, he's, I mean, just a look on his face if you watch the, the, the old clips. He's saying, you know, the, seeing a black man lobby for South Africa is like a Nazi lobbying for, I mean, a Jew lobbying for Nazi Germany. I mean, this is just astonishing. And, 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 and so that was the kind of reaction that a lot of these, these, these people got. Um, so what the South African government figured is that, you know, we can't do this overtly. So then they turned to a number of other ways of, of trying to convince African Americans that sanctions are bad. Um, and they're bad because they will hurt the very people that you care about. So in 1987, right after sanctions were passed by Congress that overrode the veto by President Reagan on his first foreign policy defeat, uh, and a significant foreign policy defeat for President Reagan. Uh, this group shows up calling itself the uh, Wake Up America Coalition. They're in D.C. They bring all these kids from D.C., uh, school children from D.C., to take these black dolls to Congress. And so this is called Operation Heartbreak. And so the, the black dolls are representing the kids who would be harmed in South Africa by the sanctions. <clears throat> and so this, the, the guy who's leading this is, is a, a gentleman called um, um, uh, Fraser. I'm, I'm blanking on his, his first name. Kenneth Fraser, that's right. Uh, and so he launches into this thing about the ANC being terrorist and you know there's the Soviet Union is behind them. Um, 
And so people are thinking, well, what are you here for? Are you here about the children? Or are you here about the ANC being, being terrorists? The organization disappeared as quickly as it, it popped up. And so several people thought that it was a front for South, Af for South African government, but no one can, can prove it. So I eventually tracked them to this, this, this religious sect, so to speak, called the, um, the Church Tri Universal and Triumphant that is this new age religious group that is very pro-America and anti-communist that has ties to the South African government. And he was a member and, um, of this group whose leader, Elizabeth Prophet, I guess if you're going to start a, a religious movement, you have to be named Prophet. Um, and so she writes in one of her books in the 70s about Rhodesia and South Africa being the lights of Africa. That yes, apartheid is a bad thing, but the light must be supported. Because if the light is not supported, then the Soviet <coughs> Union would um, basically take over South Africa and you've got the, the minerals there, you've got the strategic importance of the location. Um, so she urged her followers, including Mr. Fraser, there to support the like. Um, I'm not going to go in. The book goes further in, in a number of other people, including uh, a gentleman named Robert Brown, who worked with Martin Luther King as a fundraiser in the, in the 60s. He is a black conservative uh, Republican who uh, runs a firm called B&C um, Associates in North Carolina. And actually, he was just at the funeral in uh, South Africa. But he worked for a number of, of American companies that had businesses in, that had businesses operating in South Africa that were opposed to sanctions. And they started a group called the Coalition on Southern Africa that was made up of black ministers who were also saying that sanctions are bad, that they will only hurt uh, black people. Um, Mr. Brown hired uh, Armstrong Williams, who many of you know, um, but he also hired uh, a gentleman named Stedman Graham that uh, many of you also know um, because of his connection to uh, a certain billionaire uh, uh, black woman who lives in Chicago who should remain nameless. Um, but <clears throat> what's that? I'm sorry? Oprah. <laughs> right, yeah. Now she now there's Oprah there's nothing in any case Oprah had anything to, to do with this, but but Mr. Uh, Mr. Graham did work for Mr. Brown and they had several events in South Africa where they um, you know gave out books and blankets to, to kids um, in Soweto mm -hmm. and and in the other townships. So anyway, there was just this really covert campaign after sanctions were imposed because the one thing I think that the South African government didn't realize at first that they later learned was that just because there was a black face promoting something did not mean that black people would immediately go out and start supporting it. So they then shifted gears and start doing through these, uh, these, these other means. So thank you again for having me. I really appreciate uh, talking to you. And, uh, just one more thing. Uh, can you tell us uh, how, how people can get hold of your, your e-book, yes. what the name of it is? And the, uh, the, the e-book is called Operation Blackwash, and it's available on Amazon. Um, and it's also available, the, the publisher is the South African Publishing Company, for, which is Afrikaan for like moonshine. Um, but anyway, it's... Uh, <laughs> But, um, and so you can get it at their website, too. It's M-A-M-P-O-E-R. Do you want to in introduce the poet? Thank you so much. I mean, there is an extremely informative presentation, which we have heard exactly nowhere else, OK? So I, I think it, it's a tribute to Global Information Network uh, track Ron down and, and, and a tribute to Ron for coming tonight and sharing that with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce uh, the poet, whose name is Fungai Mabareke, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for 
I guess a couple of years, and I first met him reading poetry at one of our earlier round tables, and I was so floored, and we videotaped it. It is on YouTube, you can see it. It's an amazing poem. Um, uh, the first name is F-U-N-G-A-I, <laughs> and the second is M-A-B-O-R-E-K-E. -E. And after you hear him read, I think you'll see why I believe he deserves a book, and I hope one will be coming soon. And I just want to also introduce myself because I <laughs> forgot. My name is Lisa Vives, and the idea of the round tables um, is to bring people together uh, from all backgrounds uh, that um, to put a table where we can all sit around and talk and share ideas about what's going on in the world and how we can make it better. So we've been doing this for about over 10 years um, and um, I hope you'll be uh, part of it in the future. We, we have a meetup site, Africana Meetup. We have um, an email list. We also have a little basket there for contributions. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce the poet, Fungai Mabareke. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Danny. And thank you all. The reason why I became a poet is really because of Nelson Mandela. I was a young guy from Zimbabwe, born somewhere in Zambia in exile because my father was also part of the freedom struggle, you know, for Zimbabwe. So there was a group called Zambuko Izibuko, which meant a crossing fort or river fort, and they, they were a political theater group community-based, so they called everybody from the community. We had doctors, professors, students, and we had a live band. But our goal when I joined was because we were campaigning for the release of Nelson Mandela. And I remember I was one of the youngest. And because of my background, my mother didn't want me to do anything political because at that time, saying Nelson Mandela was political. So I discovered the ability to write because this play, Nelson, uh, it was called Mandela, symbol of our struggle. So it was a three hour production, complete with a live band. We had the help of the Amandla Ensemble. Some of you would probably know uh, they sang political freedom songs for the ANC back in the day. So I had to learn everything, the toy toy, the songs. So we used poetry, we used uh, song, we used dance, we used music, we used drama. So in the process I found myself to be one of those that they looked out for to contribute as a voice. So, to me, Nelson Mandela was a spirit. I can't put words to describe him. Not how he lived, not what he did, not how he thought, not how he walked this earth. So, these are the only befitting words that I found and I put together. Uh, I was a little struck because I didn't, I knew that he was going to die someday, but you know, you cannot quickly go ahead and write, but because of all the emotions that had been coming from all over, from everyone, including those that suddenly appeared to have liked him, to have loved him, you know, I said, okay, let me calm down, but let me say what I feel. Another bright African sun has calmly set, completing its rotation for earthly freedom, leaving behind the gamma rays of incomparable wisdom. Humbly, it has defied the quest for invaluable martyrdom, scorching the universe to its entire inner core, lifting every voice in song, lifting every all feet in dance, 
in praise, in tribute, a giant history is born on humanity's controversial shoulders because from among the sacred temple crawls in Vesu, Holy Tlatla, the colloquial troublemaker, was born. In the beehive shaped huts of the territories in the Transke Kwakunu, Nelson Mandela was inaugurated. In the grasslands, the grazing lands, a goat herder, bravely trekking from boyhood, brazenly marching into manhood through that ceremonial traditional passage of rites, rituals that marked him closer, fit to proudly but simply be South African. When the color of skin still mattered, even when boxing was just a violent game, freedom fighting was something. You knew that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. We stand in salute to you, gallant child of Africa, as you and your comrades design the Freedom Charter, not asking but demanding equal rights for your people, the weak, the meek, the downtrodden, the masses, not mentioning but declaring freedom and equal opportunities for all the oppressed classes, oiling the wheels of change that would forge a new chapter, burning the restrictive documents that reduced your people to a mere number, the passes. We salute you, Madiba, when you learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. We salute you, Dalibonga. As you, lead a, as you led a peaceful and nonviolent campaign to liberate a country bound by the manacles of apartheid, preaching civil disobedience, discipline, and restraint against an evil system that massacred innocent children and women in Sharpville, teaching tolerance for racist bigots that tortured even the women when they stood and marched and cried Watinta Wafazi, Watinta Mbokodo. When you strike a woman, you've struck a rock. Scheming peaceful means to defy the repressive laws, to break down barriers leading to the freedom doors, to cripple the economic engines of your oppressors, we stand in salute to you, founder of Umkonto Esizwe, for summoning the spear of the nation to rise and fight against the apartheid beast even as your name was among those the regime put on the wanted list, you disappeared underground, used aliases, faced your biases, mobilized, strategized, but you were eventually found guilty. I salute you, Kawe Lamakawe, as you proclaim that the ideal of a free and democratic society, declaring that these ideals, if needs be, you too were prepared to die for. We salute you, even as you were flanked by your comrades. You marched past Robin Island's prison doors. We salute you, even when your spirit refused to be broken by those constricting cell walls. We salute you, as you held vigil to connect from within souls from without. We salute you, even when you did your hard labor breaking rocks because your struggle still continued. We salute you. Today you lie dead in Kunu. As the birds and some of prey far and from wide, owls, eagles, doves, parrots, house sparrows, and even those vultures flock to your land today. From their nests, they ascend to the skies to descend to your redeemed soils, to extend their solemn goodbyes in heartfelt but united tribute, in remembrance of your selfless spoils. In your words, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that 
respects and enhances the freedom of others. For as we sit on our sidelines, we ponder just how much we continue to wonder what they have learned. They still have to learn. Tata Madiba, it's been a long walk to freedom, but the ultimate freedom is when you marched through those pearly gates. We salute you, Kawe Lama Kawe, Lala Ngotolo. Thank you. Certainly welcome comments at this point or, or remarks. Uh, try not to make speeches because you've just heard so many. Uh, and, and let's keep it conversational. Yes, go ahead. I just want to highlight uh, the role that Ilumbe Brad played in the U.S. Uh, anti-apartheid movement. Ilumbe was on the case since the 60s. And it is Ilumbe that you know, mobilized and, and kept at it and kept at it uh, to, uh, you know, that <coughs> help that began uh, what became the U.S. anti-apartheid movement. And I just want to note that Ilumbe, most of you probably know that Ilumbe um, is um, a pretty, pretty, he's very ill. Um, he's in a nursing home where he has been for, I think, about three years now from a massive stroke. Um, he may not be, uh, you know, in, be conscious of your cards, but send him. Uh, he's in a nursing home on Amsterdam Avenue. It's called the Amsterdam House. Thank you. The Amsterdam House? Thank you. And, and let me piggyback on that just for a second. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and Herb, you probably can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but her um, Alambe uh, was, was 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 instrumental in getting uh, uh, Madiba to halt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was always in the forefront of African affairs. You know, I had a concert with Bill Lynch. Huh? Along with Bill Lynch, you're right. Yes. I, I thought of the Lumbe. I, mean, feel me. yeah. I thought of the Lumbe breath in 2009, when I was making a film in uh, the D Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC, and I really remember that my own introduction to Africa uh, took place uh, at Cornell University uh, on the day that Lumumba was murdered. And there was a big um, march on the campus. Uh, and, uh, you know, about 300 people, African students there, but many others, turned out uh, to, to march in Lumumba's honor. And of course, Lumumba was the leader of the uh, Patrice Lumumba coalition. But in, and you'll say more about it. I just want to tell my little story here. Bringing me in, into knowledge about Africa. And, and he said, well, uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to try to arrange something for you. He didn't tell me what it was. and that, Next night, he took me to Lumumba's house in Kinshasa and introduced me to his son and members of his family who, who knew nothing about this event in faraway Cornell University, you know, 50 years earlier. And uh, his son was so moved that he took me into Lumumba's study and I, to sit at his desk and to see the artwork that was there and, and all the rest of it. It was very moving all these years later to connect with the actual Lumumba family after having been, you know, inspired by his struggle and his martyrdom so many years earlier. Are you going to say Nelly? You? Yeah, I just wanted to mention about uh, Ilambe. Uh, her boy was talking about a floodgate of memories that came back to the photographer. I was in South Africa as an, a, an election observer. I organized an ecumenical delegation of uh, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Reverend Al Sharpton was part of the uh, delegation. And this is uh, captured in Walker's book, uh, Soweto Diaries, because that's mm -hmm. where we were, uh, the first democratic uh, elections uh, in South Africa. And I can remember, like everybody else, I used to work, it was a project of the American Committee on Africa 
uh, John Hauser uh, that you talked about. And of course, we were all there. I met Joe Slovo. I mean, it was just incredible. I have pictures of taken of Mandela when he was dancing. We could all get close to him, and everybody met him for a fraction of a second. Uh, you know, your, your greatness and people like Kenneth Tawunda and everybody who was there. And I had great shots of uh, Charlene Mitchell and <coughs> Bombay Brack and all of us partying in Sorrento. And it, 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 was just, it was just amazing. Well, you know, I think that these memories and these moments really connected us to another world, but that was also an extension, you know, of, of our world. And I think there are many people here whose lives were transformed by these experiences and still are living, you know, these experiences. The organization Shared Interest, which is in the house, has done such a good job of, 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 of raising, you know, money for women, uh, farmers, and development projects in South Africa. And, all of these efforts grew out of this movement. You know, even President Obama actually spoke about how it was the anti-apartheid movement that politicized him, even if he's forgotten some of the lessons uh, of it. Uh, and, 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 or maybe all of them. And I just would like to mention somebody who asked me to say hello to you all uh, tonight. Uh, my, my partner on the project called Sun City, Artist Against Apartheid, Stephen Van Zandt, the, who became an actor on The Sopranos and other productions in the Bruce Springsteen Band. The Bruce Springsteen Band is going to South Africa for the first time in January. Little Stephen will be going there as well. And he was particularly upset, I will add, at the attention uh, that Paul Simon has been receiving lately as someone who actually broke the cultural boycott and has honored the New York Times and on CNN uh, and who issued a statement of support, you know, blah, blah, blah. But little Stephen, uh, you know, was troubled by that. But he, he's also somebody who really made a point of trying to use music uh, to raise awareness and to raise money for the right things. Willie, you were going to say something? Three years ago, you took uh, a quicker time to rise. Now it takes a little longer because it's a bad problem. Uh, first, I just want to thank um, the people that are here and actually those who fought against party during all those years. I mean, I came here as a young man, I think I was 19 or so, and uh, where I'm going actually is uh, highlighting. Johnny McCarthy in his work, because uh, uh, everyone has forgotten about uh, Johnny McCarthy. Johnny, yeah. He yes. was our chief representative here, yeah. opened the office of the Afternessal Congress, and uh, I learned a lot politics, diplomacy, and so forth, working at the UN for eight years or more. But uh, I tried, I was interviewed on CNN the other day, the day Mandela passed on. And, uh, but they cut the interview short because my first words were to thank the American public for their contribution in the fight against apartheid. And uh, I think basically summed up everything about mainstream media that uh, they were not interested in that. They wanted to find out how I felt being here. You know, I'm visiting here for a month or so. And it's a blessing in disguise that uh, I am here in this period when Mandela has passed on. Because there is solidarity, there is a bond with the people here, uh, with some of us. Uh, you know, it's not a speech as such, but Mandela I met uh, back in South Africa, or well, here, in, back in South Africa. Uh, we did some interviews and so forth. Then I got married in 1996. And he came to my wedding, uh, you know, which was, which was great. Um, then I interacted with him over a period of time. And in 2001, I was in Mozambique, at Grasa Michelle's uh, place. And I think being a young man and very impatient about certain things, 
things are not changing fast enough in South Africa, mainly South Africa, by, for some reason, as we're sitting there, because those uh, Michelle's brothers, late brothers, very, I think there were about 20 of us or so, um, and he asked me to come and sit next to him. And I said, okay, fine. You know, I'll take this opportunity to express myself about certain things. By the way, my wife, the woman that I married, is uh, of Italian descent uh, from a place called Calabria in South <coughs> Peter. She's a journalist currently for CBS, uh, South Africa, the bureau chief for CBS. But she's the one that broke the story about Mandela's death and other stories. So Mandela, in this opportunity that I saw, I said, you know, I go around many places with my wife, who is white, in South Africa. And all I'm hearing over and over again, South Africans, not all, but quite a large percentage of them, are not changing. They see Mandela, as Danny explained, this Father Christmas, this person who just walked out of jail. And they see the rest of black people as evil. Mm. It's only Mandela. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And I told him that, and I regretted saying that to him because, but I said, at the same time, I'm going to say it. And he listened to me. He heard what I was saying. He because, but you can't take that away from a man of his stature, basically, because he's without him. Uh, South Africa, there could have been a bloodshed, you know? So, in all this, there are two people that I want to thank, actually. Johnny Makatin. Johnny. Johnny Makatin. Mm. And Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela. For the, but the struggle still has to continue. And I'm very grateful that the spirit is still there. You know, there are many problems in South Africa. The problem that I've just spoken about, the rights, we hold the economy, we don't have to change. And other issues that are beginning to be addressed. I'm not a politician. I was a politician before. I'm a filmmaker. And in that spirit, I think I may share many of the concerns that you have about many things and so forth. But there are certain things that are being addressed and take a long time, 20 years, you know. But we can't make excuses all the time about certain things. Hopefully, yeah, yeah hopefully things, you know, will be addressed and so forth. Like one thing, the last thing I'm going to say, Danny, sorry, is that in South Africa, many people, for instance, in the municipalities, the, the people that are elected into positions, didn't have the skills to do things. Mm. You know, I, I think <laughs> I studied accounting at Lincoln, you know. And uh, the thing is, like, many of us can't even read a balance sheet or Some other people and never, never went to school. They're just put in politics. They're popular in the region and they're put into positions of power. Oh. It's only now that this thing is being addressed. <laughs> by the Department of Public Administration to say this is causing a revolution because if they can't perform, it reflects on government, which is an ANC government. But I'm not in that space. I'm merely <laughs> highlighting these two things that are going on in South Africa right now, that the economy, to a large extent, is in the hands of people who don't want to change. Mandela extended the hand of friendship, is gone. These issues must be faced head on yeah. for South Africa to yeah. be better. Thank you, Willie. Yeah. I, I see a few hands here. Let's try to move through everybody who wants to speak, to give them a chance to speak. But I also would like to leave some time for us just to schmooze with each other and chat informally. <coughs> so let's let's try to be disciplined. And, and I know I see some hands of people who have spoken. That's okay. but just. Really keep your comments short if possible. Uh, in, in the behind you, there's a gentleman. Uh, my name is Bully, and my name is Dalisa. I'm from Senegal. Well, I'm really happy. If my English is bad, 
don't blame me on Francophone. Unfortunately. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's, it's, so, it's not bad. It's yeah. Not bad. Um, <laughs> one thing caught my I mean um, attention is that in the in the Memorial Day with um, <coughs> All the people that was attending, the, I mean, the Memorial Day, basically um, Nicolas Sarkozy, a French, who um, in 2010 in Dakar, I was a student last year of undergrad in history, read a lot about Jean de Dieu, and he said that the black men don't enter the page of history yet. And I wonder what he felt, you know, the day when. I mean, Orlando had the really um, the, 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 the ability to invite him with him to go there. So um, we're trying, and I'll, I'm, I'm calling everybody, you know, I will let my email with you guys, to build with my people because I was an advocate for students, a nonviolent advocate, and we change. We know what students use to strike in Africa. Everything is about violence. And thank God we changed our university because of Nelson Mandela. And I was called all the time Lumumba, which he also you bring back. My name there was, you know, Lumumba because also of his nonviolence, you know, the lady. So we're trying to build a Nelson Mandela house in the car. But we wanna put every single book that people write, critics or about his philosophy, every newspaper, that house would be only about his life, his books, no matter if the book is with him or against him. So we will be happy, you know, for your help about that. Thank you. Can I pay respect to a, a singer from Senegal who sang for uh, Mandela and also against the party, Yusu Ndur, yes, Ndur. Uh, who, uh, who I got to know? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Stephen Tebbit. I come from Cameroon. <coughs> and uh, I'd like to say just two things that the life of uh, Mandela taught us two lessons. One, that we Africans first, we have to be ready to sacrifice for our people, uh, not to be ready to run over to Europe or to the United States when we have problems in our own countries. We ought to stay and fight for what we believe in. The second thing I want to remark is that quite often we have been very harsh on white domination and white exploitation of Africans. But we are very clement when it comes to judging Africans themselves, <laughs> who are the greatest exploiters, the greatest killers of our own people. I speak as somebody who has been an advisor, who is an advisor to a, a number of African presidents, living and dead. And I see very little judgment from the progressive community in America very few demands on these African, black African leaders who are actually doing worse to their people than the apartheid regime did to blacks in South Africa. This double sense of judgment, this double, yes. it seems to me it's patronizing. It seems as if the progressive movement in America <coughs> thinks that blacks are too inferior that's to lift true. up to the standards oh, yeah. that they require white leaders to live up to. That is how we, that is not true. as African, no. feel, it's, it's a, especially those of us. I would just interject. Thank you so much. I, 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 I don't want to cut anybody off, but at the same time, look at the time. There was this woman in the very end over here. I'm sorry, I'm going to call on you next. You talked about somewhere along the line, somebody talked about someone who was going to make a speech in South Africa who had a Caucasian wife. I wonder, with you being a diplomat, politician, and all of the things you have, given the racial connotations of the things that happened in South Africa, what has your life been as a South African with a white South African wife? That's my question. I'm not only married to my ex-wife, but that's besides the point. But uh, I think South Africa overall, racially, is very uh, tolerant. People intermingle, they marry whoever they want, and so forth. If people fight, they fight. Like, you know. 
Okay. Like oil and gas. Yeah. That's what it is. But basically, I mean, it's so intermixed. If you've been there, Danny knows. I mean, everyone has been there. It's just you do whatever you want. Comment. So. Sister Vibes, it's coming to the end of the year. And I want to commend you for your valiant effort in having these kind of forums where you can come together and discuss. But I would like to say this. I've been, I spent a little time in, 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 in London at one time. And I used to love to visit Hyde Park. Hyde Park is a place that is, is, is it's just exciting. There, people get a chance to interact, and I hate this kind of format. I love when people mix it up and we, we exchange ideas and thoughts. I hate to sit down and listen to a whole lot of stuff, and then they grant you a little favor of asking a question or something. I don't like that. So maybe in the new year, you will change that format up so we can all wrap it up and, and, and have some good exchanges. And out of that, I believe, some progressive ideas and thoughts will come. I would like to say real quick, I had, because I don't, I'm one that don't believe apartheid is over. It's very much alive and well. I was, I had a discussion on WBAI one morning with a man by the name of George Galbraith or some of the sort. He's a British parliamentarian. And we were discussing the same issue, uh, the apartheid, George Galway, thank you. This apart, apartheid, he was trying to convince me that apartheid is, 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 is ended. Because he said he was there before and he was there after. And he was giving me all kind of reason why it, it, it has ended. And so finally I said to him, how can a system be ended when those the architects of that system, the people who created that system, every institution that they created is alive and well it's in their hands. The land and everything, what is above the land and under the land is in the hands of those, those criminals. How can the system be ended? He finally said to me, it is ended because the blacks, the blacks now have a right to vote and they have a right to marry white, which goes back to something the brother said over there a moment ago. Now, I had to get real pissed off on telling that the revolution was not about black folks having the right to marry white. And also, we talk so much about democracy. Democracy is a con game. Democracy is a kind of game that poor folk, black folk can't afford to do the price of that game. Right? So the same thing, the democracy that we got here in America, that when I came to this country in the early, very early 60s, and I saw how Africans in America, what they went through, dogs, biting the flesh out, and the Bull Connors and, and, and John Wallace and all these folks putting black folk to all this kind of stuff. And now, we are, you have the right to vote, and you see how these boys are using the courts, and they do not kind of uh, uh, trick to deprive African people the right to vote in this country. It's the same scheme, and the same scam is going on in South Africa. We keep watching, uh, uh, what's this brother's name, the president now? Zuma. <laughs> We are watching Zoom and his, and his bunch of proxy apartheid leaders. We are watching them while they are robbing and plundering the, the country with the apartheid. Uh, I'm really, I think they're getting the apartheid crumbs. They are getting the crumbs from apartheid. Mm -hmm. Because I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. No, I'm wrapping up. Are you wrapping? I'm wrapping up. Are you wrapping? Wrap yes. Wrap it then. <laughs> now, you have, I want to know what happened to revolutionary, young revolutionaries when they get old. They become what? Uh, the ANC has become. They are a traitor to their people. They are selling the African people out because what should have happened is the transfer of the res Africa's resources to its people. And that, that, that does not happen. The land, now the resources are not being transferred to the African people. And there's no way on God's earth. After South Africa, the Africans can develop and become anything in the country if they don't control the resources. So we can't come here and talk right. how we want to talk. That's if right. that talk is not on the table, if the young people today are not going to fight to take back what is theirs, we can come here and, and, and romanticize at the end of the so-called animal party how we want to. But the, we are doing a disservice to the Africans in South Africa. Excuse me. It's 10 after 9. I see your hand.
I see it, and then there's a lot of other people. I make it succinct. You make it succinct. Okay. I was so glad um, the other morning on BAI when you mentioned Paul Simon, okay, because he did an insidious thing of getting the approval, he said, from Harry Belafonte. Okay, but he was not the only one, you know, and, and uh, there's a, a popular, used to be, well, he's still popular talk show host on LIV that had Curtis Mayfield. And I got through, and I says, Curtis, why did you go to South Africa? Curtis. And Curtis said, I wanted to see my for myself. He got out of it. Now, the problem I had with that is that that same talk show host had, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, he used to play with the drums for Jimi Hendrix. Had him on. He made some crazy statement, and he held him over the, the commercial to, to, to um, clarify a statement, but he did not hold Curtis Mayfield, and Curtis Mayfield got out of it. Yes, he did, her boy. Okay, so that's the essence of succinctness. So you uh, can't, so I'm saying you yeah, cannot yeah, at that time. I'm trying to be a copier. I think people would like to continue this. Hold on, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm willing to take, let's have a, if you want to just let this keep going for the rest of the night, please put up your hand, and we'll do it. Okay? If you, no, if you, is that people are here to get your book. You get in line, you sign your book, yeah. and let people com uh, converse some yeah, other sure. stuff. I, I hereby <laughs> resign the chair. Thank you so much. <laughs> Danny may have resigned the chair, but I think it's important that we engage some of the questions that the gentleman down here brought up. Because the fact is, 10 years, 20 years now into formal equality in, the, in South Africa, we are in a situation where the people are poor and as well as worse off than they were actually 20 years ago. And the question that has to be addressed is, why was the revolution defeated? And what lessons are we going to learn out of that? It's the lesson we're going to learn that has been drawn out from old Karl Marx talking about the Paris Commune down to Avakian summing up the revolutions of the 20th century, that the only way you can transform and free people from the clutches of the capitalist system is in fact to dismantle that system completely, absolutely, and build entirely new institutions from below. That was the elephant in the room all evening, and that was the issue that we didn't get into. You got called on, I didn't. Bob never done the Thank you.